Hello and welcome to Controlling Water, a space for us to talk valves, water meters and interesting insights about the water industry. Each episode, we're joined in conversation by industry professionals that specialise in all things valves, meters and best practice knowledge in the water industry. We are here with Colin Kirkland from Bermad Water Technologies, who is one of the product managers in the team. Colin has many years industry experience in working with pressure reducing stations. In this episode of Controlling Water, we are discussing with Colin some of his typical mistakes many customers make when designing and installing new pressure reducing stations. Welcome Colin, it's great to have you. Thank you, good to be here. So let's dive right in. Is this a common problem that you see in many installations and are these problems only associated with a specific application and are some applications more problematic than others? Yes, it's a good question. There's lots of content there, but yes. In, in many of the different applications, there's different design criteria that really matter to each of the applications. And what I thought might be useful was just to talk a little bit about maybe four of the applications. Let's say take a building, build, high-rise building where mm -hmm. we've had PRVs. And then we might talk a little bit about, say, a water supply network where we've had major issues and then look at potentially a, a mine situation where we've had a PRV, and then irrigation. And each one of those four applications have completely different needs, concerns, and different design problems that were, that were there. And as an example, I thought I might start with, um, in, a, in a high rise building, I was not long ago, I was in a hospital. And the situation was is that we had a pressure reducing valve in a hospital where it, it required maintenance, but there was no way of bypassing the water and the water was supplying a maternity ward. Now it turns out I had to maintain that valve at 12 o'clock at night. It took weeks to shut the water supply off and it was a big issue. You know, that's just not, not good design, mm. you know. We got it working and we got it all there and everyone was stressed. But, you know, in reality, you just can't turn water off in hospitals and in buildings. It's just not practical, right. you know, so that was a big thing. Conversely, I can remember getting that panic phone call when a client rings and sort of says, Colin, I can remember this was in central Victoria in a reasonably small town, and they said, you know, Colin, we've, um, we've got this valve that's jammed open, it's broken the pipe in so many locations, and we're supplying a small uh, country hospital at the same time. Oh, wow. And uh, we raced up and we had a look, and it turns out that a lump of concrete had come off and jammed the valve open. Oh, now, no. if we had made some changes to the design, that would have been all nice, but again, they had to shut the water supply off in an emergency, no bypass. It was panic stations, you know, oh, but we got yeah. it going in the end. Yeah. And um, it got me thinking too about mining, you mm -hmm. know. So in a mine, for example, I can always remember when I first started with the company, we had uh, this panic phone call from our distributor in Tasmania where this gold mine, a pressure reducing valve had stopped working. And they basically said, Colin, I don't care what it costs. Can you build one, get it to the airport now, wow. get it on next flight? Because apparently it was costing millions of dollars a day to have this PRV. And if it wasn't working, the mine stopped working. So everyone who came out, there was no fire protection, there was no production. So everything stops. Oh my and they said, Colin, the money doesn't matter. We need this now. So, you know, good planning and everything else would have avoided that, you know? Definitely. And, um, and then conversely, the last one I was going to talk about was an irrigation because I can remember having this situation where we were using treated effluent to, uh, to irrigate racetracks, which is the treated effluent is really good because it's got lots of nutrients and it's all great. I remember them saying, you know, Colin, we've had to shut down this pipeline. We've had to drain an entire pipeline of treated effluent in a, in a community, which is not terrific. Mm. Didn't have a place to put the water. Oh. And it turns out that turtles had been growing in the pipeline. No. And one of them was jammed under the valve. Oh. Now, <laughs> the poor turtle. Yeah. You know? But in saying that, we had to displace a lot of treated effluent in an irrigation system that right. was not terrific. No. You know, so I was just trying to highlight a few different applications there where specific things are really specific to some industries. And I thought we could maybe just share some of the key things to think of and to think about how we can overcome some of those typical issues. Sounds great, yeah. sounds great. So I'm keen to go back to the first example you mentioned, mm. the high-rise buildings, and you yeah. mentioned pressure reducing valves in those types of buildings. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm, I presume that these are used to balance the pressure to each resident, regardless of what level they are yes. on in the building. Exactly. What are the installational design issues here that tend to give the most issues, the most problems? Yeah, in in buildings, uh, it's it's a real challenge to engineers because if you think about the major cities and you've got 
20 or 30 floors. What they're really looking at when they're designing a building is to give as much room to the residents as possible, to make the, you know, the uh, apartments or offices look as nice as possible. But there's very little space mm. to put all of the pipes that are going up and down the buildings and where to put them. So what we found in some older buildings is that these valves a lot of the times are, are in lift wells mm. or they're in stairwells or they're in very tricky locations to get to. Mm. So the problem that exists with a lot of cases is that if if you don't think about not only just putting a PRV in but being really honest about what's required, look you're going to have to maintain this. You may have to pull the valve apart so you may have to shut the water supply off. No, nope, we're not going to do that. Okay, so we need a bypass mm. or we need a bypass PRV and if you think about these buildings which they're getting taller and taller to take a, a, a valve offline and take water off to eight floors of a building really isn't practical. So in a lot of the times, the, the valves are in really hard to get to locations. They're upside down, they're yeah. on their side yeah. because there's all sorts of pipes and electrics and everything else all around there. So one of the key things in a building which is really critical that we've found that mistakes have been made is that there's no bypass, mm -hmm. you know, and that's just not practical. You know, if you were, in the penthouse in the top and you had a multi-million dollar property and you said, listen, we're going to turn the water off for four hours. They're not going to be very happy, you know. No. So so getting that design done down right at the start yep. with the principals, with the consultants, with the engineers to make sure that you need to have this room mm. to be able to move things in and out. You know, just little things like, you know, Colin, we can't have the valve standing upright because there's so many pipes there, but we need that to get the air out. So there's things that we can do and we can talk about the little intricacies in buildings to make it really work well and make it manageable, which is the big thing. Because in a building, you know, you need little fingers, you're working in very tight, confined spaces and it's got to be practical you know you don't want to be in a, a lift well no. working somewhere where people are coming in uh, and living their lives and here's you with your toolbox and working and stuff so it's got True. to be practical yes. to that degree so we have specific people that really focus on buildings mm -hmm. and high-rise buildings I've got a lot of experience they've seen good installations and bad installations and it's all about experience and sharing what's good what's practical and being honest with what you need to do to them so that you can plan for those things you absolutely. know absolutely yeah. that experience is so valuable it is yeah so what about hydraulic issues in a building are they the same issues as compared to other applications in pipelines yeah look the fundamentals basically are the same um when you come to size a pressure reducing valve if you think about a high-rise building we may have call it 100 apartments in there but it's a brand new building and we might have a situation where we've got 10 residents to start with and over that year we're going to sell more of it and the demand will get greater and greater and greater so what the designers do is they size the pipes to suit the worst case situation we need that to cope with 100 percent residency maximum flow and a bit more just to be to be sure because we can't go changing the pipes later you know so the, the the key thing there is is that a lot of the time the engineers will say well look we've got a hundred millimeter pipe let's just put a hundred mil valve in mm -hmm. now realistically that valve is designed for maximum flow can it cope with the low flows so it's very very important to understand the lowest flow capability the highest flow and what the hydraulics are going to look like because in buildings for example Noise is a very big thing. You know, when you're breaking the pressure down in the pressure reducing station, there's noise and harmonics. And fortunately today, Bermat have got wonderful solutions to reduce that noise. Because if you've got a 100 millimeter valve and you're working to one resident, it's coming off the seat 0.2% and you get a little squealing right. noise. Mm -hmm. Now that squealing noise, if you have a young child mm. and you're listening to in the middle of the night someone flushing a toilet and this valve squealing you're not going to be very happy no. so <laughs> there are great solutions that we've got today to make sure that we can cope with virtually no flow up to maximum right. and it's all about sizing the valve correctly you know that valve might be a 65 millimeter valve in a 100 millimeter pipeline mm -hmm. they'll say no 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 Colin but we want to but it's all about the hydraulics mm. so that goes for any application it's so important if you're starting something off like this get the hydraulics right size the valve for flows and real life conditions and it'll work so much better rather than look we've got a 150 mil pipe we'll just put a 150 mil valve in mm -hmm. you know so mm -hmm. 
The hydraulics are really important and water quality is really, it might be hot water, it might be cold water and there's different aspects with all of that. So it's important to understand everything or as much as possible. Absolutely, yeah. all the different moving parts. That's it. So if we were moving on to a water company that was yes. supplying drinking water for residential purposes, yeah. obviously the installation is different to a building system. Yes. What are the key mistakes made here? And so how do you overcome those? Yeah. So in a residential situation, let's take let's take the example that I gave you where we had the failure in a smaller country community. Mm -hmm. um, call it, say, a thousand residents over, you know, maybe five or six kilometres spread out throughout there. A lot of the time when a lot of the designers are doing something like this, they'll say, look, Colin, this is only a hundred millimetre valve. It's a fairly small community. And I often hear this word, we just want something cheap and cheerful, <laughs> you know, because it's, it's small, it's yeah. not that important. <laughs> but the, on a serious note, you know, like if they had a country hospital there or a doctor or something and mm. we didn't design in specific redundancies to take that water offline, mm. what would you do? True. You know, and in a lot of cases, you know, I've been to jobs where they go out there and they're giving out bottled water to all the residents and saying, look, I'm very sorry, we're going to turn the water supply off. And it's wow. it's an issue, yeah, you know. Absolutely. So with water supply, one of the key things with water supply, different to, say, a building, is that we're not dealing with 100 metres or 200 metres of pipe mm. we're dealing with in a building. We're talking about kilometres of pipe. Absolutely. And when we're designing those pipelines or when they were built maybe 50 years ago, when the pipes age, they become more brittle, mm -hmm. they become more sensitive. So... Accuracy, stability, and really good operation of PRVs in aging infrastructure is really important, that it works really well. Mm -hmm. And without bypasses, without uh, sufficient air release valves, and if, to take that example that I had with you, you know, where we had a lump of concrete came off. Now, the reason why the concrete came off the pipeline was that they were doing roadworks. And the roadworks, uh, they were using, they call it, like, call it a waka, which is what they compress the soil with and everything. Oh, yeah. And it damaged the pipe and a lump of concrete came off and jammed the valve open. Oh. Now, when we were designing a pressure reducing station, if we'd put a strainer in before there, that would never have happened. Because right. it would have jammed in the strainer, still would have worked, mm -hmm. everything would have been happy. So mm -hmm. the good advice is in any of these applications, and it's more so on water supply is to do some risk analysis with mm -hmm. designers and say, look, honestly, Colin, what are some of the things that can go wrong here? And we can say, well, these are the potential problems. And you, it doesn't have to be the Rolls Royce of stations, but mm. we have to think practically, look, what are you going to do if we have to turn the water off? Because what we generally recommend is that after 10 years of operation, we want to pull the guts of the valve out basically, inspect the critical components mm -hmm. and put that back in. Now, if that means turning the water off, now, if the community is such that that's not a big deal, fine. But if it is a big deal, we need to think of it now yeah. and what we're going to do to... And I can still remember 20 years ago working in a very large water company where they didn't have a bypass. So what they did was they actually had... Uh, they put in a temporary bypass around and they had an operator standing there with a hand wheel and a gate valve looking at a big pressure gauge. Now, have you ever seen fear in someone's eyes? <laughs> this poor chap had to modify this valve to watch this gauge and make sure it wasn't oh going to break goodness. the pipeline. And wow. the guys are looking at me going, Colin, speed is everything here, Colin. We need to get this done quickly. I get that. <laughs> so again, a lot of the, it comes back to the fundamentals, I guess, here. And, and because water supply you would think it's drinking water. It doesn't mm. need as much maintenance. It, it does. Absolutely, it does. doesn't matter the brand or whatever. Yep. So it's making sure you've got those fine-tuning things in. So when they speak to some of our, our engineers that work in water authorities, they'll basically say, so look, let's put in two line strainers in the valve so that we can we can open one up and we can take one offline and we can make it work without taking it offline. Mm -hmm. Now that costs another thousand dollars, you know, but you might think, but they, they don't want to spend that much money, but that's okay. Mm. It's just being aware of what those issues are. And a lot of the time, a thousand dollars in a 50 year design life is nothing. Yeah. You know, it makes it easy to maintain. So it's making the, it's making the, the, the installation, the design, and the ability for operators to work on it, mm. safe, mm -hmm. practical, mm -hmm. and, and really just make it work and work reliably 24-7 because 
That's what a building does. That's what a water supply does. It's 24 seven operation, never turn it off. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Let's take a short break. If you have any questions that you would like answered during this podcast, feel free to get in touch with us through our website, burmad.com.au, or send us an email, info at burmad.com.au, and Colin will be sure to answer them. Now, back to the show. So I understand that irrigation then would be similar, or are there specific differences? How does, how does that work? Well, in irrigation, there's a very different mentality. So if you were a grower of flowers or you were growing you know, uh, vines or whatever, you're spending the grower's money Yes, okay. True. Instead of you're with a water company, you're with a large community, they'll spend the money to do it. But look, I'm Scottish and I'm a bit miserable. But <laughs> when it comes to it, you know, if they said, Colin, look, should we put an isolating valve before this pressure reducing valve? And they might sort of say, well, how often are you going to have to do this? Well, we'll not worry about it. Mm -hmm. You know, so sometimes there's a lot of compromise that's made in irrigation as compared to water supply. But the key thing with irrigation, of course, is that in irrigation, you're basically only irrigating when, you know, the natural rainfall is not keeping up. Sure. Now, in in a lot of that cases, it's the peak in summer. But Mm -hmm. the critical nature of irrigation in summer is that, you know, you can be in locations where it's 42 degrees for three days. And if you stop watering the plants, they're going to stress to the point where potentially they could die. Mm. You're, you're reducing the yields and everything else. Now, if we haven't taken into consideration some of the, the design aspects of taking it offline and maintaining it, again, with bypasses and all mm. that sort of stuff, mm-hmm. then we have to think about that, you know. Sure. And usually, you know, when they've had a fault once, then they'll come in and put those things in, you know. But there's a lot of other different things in irrigation. So a lot of times, you know, the valves are not in nice concrete pits or they're not in nice cabinets. They're sitting on the ground. Yeah. <laughs> so if they're sitting on the ground, we may potentially have frost issues. Right. You know, and if you've got a situation where you're in Tasmania and you've got an apple orchard, and we use a lot of irrigation, as crazy as it sounds, in frost protection that says, look, if we're going to get a frost and that's going to damage the fruit, we'll spray water over the top of it to avoid the frost. Mm-hmm. Now, if the valve freezes over because we haven't put a blanket over it or yeah. something, then that's a big issue. It is. And that can cost thousands in a crop. Mm. So there's also things like um, I might have a central pivot in and be working and irrigating poppies mm-hmm. or irrigating uh, you know, wheat or potatoes. Now, if we have cattle that come into that property and cattle love rubbing up against anything because they're itchy, yeah. and if they rub up against the valve and it breaks, well... That's catastrophic. You know, I can remember once being in Tasmania and I remember we had a serious frost this one night and a grower had just planted out a whole section of um, poppies and uh, medicinal poppies. And what had happened is the the valve had uh, frozen overnight. It had opened and it discharged onto the paddock and virtually destroyed a whole paddock. Basically, it washed off and it was a major problem. Wow. Now, putting an empty roundup drum or putting a hessian bag over the top of the valve would have stopped all that. Right. So again, like the buildings and the water, speaking to irrigation people mm. who truly understand the cost of money, uh, the costs that are associated sort of thing, but look, this is these are the fundamentals. Mm. And when you impart that information and you really train and educate people, they're very appreciative because they say, oh, look, Colin, that's a good point. I wouldn't have thought about that. Yeah. You know, so, and even things like, um, I've heard things of where when it's very dry, you have rabbits and hares come in and eat the tubes. No way, really? Yeah, because they want water and they find something, so they come, and then the valve opens and all of a sudden... Yeah, you know, all sorts of problems. You've got a you've got a horse stud with million dollar horses mm. being freaked out by valves that have opened because of all this. So I'm just trying to give you sort of specific types of issues that tend to happen in those cases. So again, the important thing there is not to talk to one of the building services engineers, but speak to one of the irrigation managers that really understand this mm. with 30 years experience on getting those horrible phone calls Absolutely. <laughs> where things go wrong. Absolutely. Yeah. It's really interesting how these examples are, there's so much specificity in each example oh, that yes. you're describing as well. And fundamentally, the valves do the same thing, mm. but all with different needs, wants and Absolutely. concerns. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. 
So I'm, I'm keen to turn to the fourth example that you mentioned yes. in mining. Yes. And it seems like these issues would be an amalgamation of all these applications. Is that, yes. is that correct? Uh, yeah, absolutely. In mining is a really interesting one because sometimes when a mine is, uh, is operational, it's because they can mine the product mm -hmm. and make money in it. But if the commodity price drops, mm. that mine stops. Yes. You know, so yep. a lot of the time they'll basically say, look, this mine's got a six-year design life mm -hmm. and we want the infrastructure to last six years. Mm -hmm. And if it wears out, so what? Right. You know, so they're not looking at the long, long term that uh, a water supply might be using or a building because a building, mm -hmm. you know, we want that there for a long time. Sure. So, but at the same time, the costs in having a valve break down. That example I gave you of that mine where this was in a decline. So what we mean by that is you're basically, you're going into a mountain 800 meters, mm -hmm. you're going three kilometers down below ground. Wow. And the water is used for uh, the fire suppression, it's used for the, the processes in dust suppression, and it's used for the whole mining operation. No water, no mine. Mm -hmm. Now, that example I was giving you was is that when that PRV broke down because it wasn't being maintained, mm. it was like, okay, so go get one from the store. Well, we don't have one. <laughs> so it's like there's conversations that go on that are absolute panic struck, you know. Sure. So the thing is, is that do you want to put a secondary valve in next to it? Um, well, look, we find today a lot of newer installations, yes, they are. They're putting in duty standby. They're putting in strainers beforehand to avoid something coming in and blocking it. So there's a lot of things that mines do uh, importantly today that they weren't doing in the past, mm -hmm. but a lot of mines might be taken offline for six years. Commodity prices come back up for zinc or lithium or something, mm -hmm. so it comes back online. Mm -hmm. But the aging infrastructure hasn't updated with process. Yeah. So with mining, the mentality is, look, Colin, we don't care if it wears out in three years, we'll just put another valve in mm -hmm. and we'll keep one. So the important thing is with mining is to be really honest. Look, you've sized this valve and we're going to use a 300 millimeter valve for this application. Normally we'd use a 400 millimeter to, for security, but look, we understand you're not really interested in inefficiencies too much, but make it work to a cost, mm -hmm. make it reasonably reliable, and mm -hmm. we'll be happy with that. Mm -hmm. But what if it fails? Mm. So it, it's, it's a very difficult conversation to have with a client where you want to bring up potential failure of a product. You know, you're, you're, you're bearing your underbelly a little bit and saying, sure. <laughs> look, I'm being honest with you here. You yeah. need to maintain this, and certain things can go wrong and will go wrong if you don't maintain it. Mm. And in mines, you know, these mines are usually in very lo remote locations. They're in areas where you can't just come to Sydney or Brisbane and get some training. These are out in Mount Isa. These mm. are up in the northern... T these are in very remote locations. Yes. And it's, it's very difficult to impart all of that knowledge to a lot of people and understandings to make sure it works really well. Mm. But the big thing in mines, of course, too, as well, is if I was to take that example, if you were below ground, if a valve were to fail and you're in a very confined space with exceptionally high pressures and this fails, it's all about ock health and safety too as well. Mm -hmm. You know, you can flood a mine in a heartbeat. And mm -hmm. I I've, can honestly tell you, I've been into mines where they said, Colin, we want you to come down into this mine and look at this valve and try and fix it for me. And um, I've looked at the gauges going ballistic thinking, this is scary and if this fails wow. you know we'll flood this area and there'll be people running and that's not great no. i'm not trying to be dramatic or mm. you know uh scare people into thinking the valves don't work and they need a lot of maintenance but it's about having due diligence about what potentially can go wrong planning for that and putting an extra valve in or a strainer or a relief valve or or whatever we need to make it work well definitely and it's the same with all of those applications it's being really honest absolutely and imparting the information yeah. yeah and really understanding each environment and each yes. situation very specifically so that you can recommend that's the best right solution and that's why we have people within our organization that that's their forte they really understand mining well they've done it before they've seen the problems Whereas they really don't know what happens in an apple orchard or mm. in a vineyard, but mm. surely it's the same. Well, it's not. It's similar, but not the same. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I know we've spoken about the training facilities, yes. Colin. Um, we've spoken about them before in previous episodes. Yes. Yeah. How do you suggest that 
potential customers might get in contact with you to obtain this information? Yeah. If you were to ask me, the biggest thing and the most important thing of this podcast would be, irregardless of application, whatever, it's all about imparting good information to people because there's generally not a lot of these products out in the market, it's not something they deal with every day. So having really good information out to people is, is what really makes the risk of failure come down huge time. Mm-hmm. So we do, when we do a lot of commissioning, if we do commissioning at that point, we, we train people and we impart that knowledge. And this is why we spend so much emphasis on things like technical training seminars, a lot of video animations, a lot of articles, a lot of good sheets so that people can get that at a time when they want it. Mm -hmm. So the thing that we find really useful with our website, for example, is that that's our library. You know, in the past, you'd produce a hard catalogue and you'd get that to the people and they'd put it on a shelf somewhere. But today, no one does that. They all look at the internet. True. (laughs) Uh, uh, When I fix my lawnmower, I want to look at YouTube. You know, when I do (laughs) all that. So we impart so much knowledge and honest information on all of our stuff on on YouTube, Mm. on our website, with all of that to get it. Because in a lot of cases, you know, when I was mentioning Mount Isa or Mm. in central Tasmania or New South Wales or in the Pilbara, you can go to this source and get the information or you can come to our training facilities. Mm. The thing that I've, I know we've spoken about it before, but the thing Mm. that I found was probably the most critical thing with dealing with any of our products is actually touching the product, using it in a safe environment. I don't want to go on and on about the training facilities, but we do have them in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, Perth, and obviously our our mobile service in in the Riverina too as well. Doing that and spending the time Mm. to come to it, because I know we've had feedback from mines, especially Mm -hmm. when they're very remote, that they've come to, to Perth, they've listened to Rod talk about the valves, show them how they work, why they work, and they've said, look, this is so valuable Mm -hmm. and I know it's a a long flight to come into Perth and do this but what they've gained is knowledge and it's empowering people to really make their products work and work reliably so I would really encourage people to really go to our site bearmad.com.au have a look at some of the tools and things we've got there and uh, and be empowered sounds like an excellent uh, next step Colin (laughs) that's right thank you so much for the chat great it's been a pleasure Thank you. For more learnings about the water industry, including products, tips, installations, operation and maintenance techniques, head over to bermad.com.au and subscribe to our industry newsletter. You'll join more than 3,000 industry professionals and learn from the experienced Bermad team of industry specialists. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Controlling Water. For more episodes, resources and how-tos, head to bermad.com.au.